You're listening to The Pithy Chronicle. History with a bite. I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we bring you history's dirtiest deeds dripping with sarcasm. Are you hungry yet? Welcome back, Pithy listeners. Sadly, this is our last spooktacular episode for the month of October. We hope you've enjoyed our spooktacular series, and if you are sad to see it go, fear not. We have plenty of salacious and scandalous stories brewing in our pithy cauldron. So, while the theme music might change, the excitement The drama, the history still remains. Keep up with us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Also, feel free to visit our website, thepithychronicle.com, for more information about us or our sources. And we're giving a special shout out now to our patrons on Patreon. We are so grateful for your continued support. Any little bit helps keep the historical stories spicy. Mm. Or, in this case, spooky. Fittingly, today's episode is hitting your devices on Halloween, a special day for necromancers, demons, sorcerers, and spirits, all of which are a part of today's terrifying topic, demonology. Erica, have you ever heard of this esteemed literary work before? I'm sad to say that I haven't because I feel like I did quite a bit of research about witches during our witch trial episode. And this didn't come up? This amazing treatise? Um, (sighs) no. Believe it or not, it did not make the cut. Well, the king, James VI of Scotland, or the first of England, he would be so disappointed. Because demonology, or daemonology, depending on how fancy you want to get with your Scottish accent, is a dissertation on contemporary necromancy and the historical relationships between various forms of ancient black magic written by the high and mighty King James VI of Scotland. And England. I know. (laughs) Well, no, so... So this was while he was just King of Scotland, not quite of England yet. Yes. He wrote this while he was King Mm. of Scotland. When he ascended to the English throne, which we'll touch on here, he did re-release it with a new publication that lauded his many extra titles. It's like Taylor's version. But it was originally written by the King of Scotland, who was kind of hopeful he'd get to inherit, but wasn't so sure. Tell me everything. Once upon a time, far, far away on the hazy moors of Scotland, lived a devout Protestant king named James. His life had been difficult. His mother, the infamous Mary, Queen of Scots, was forced to abdicate when her son was but 13 months old. Fleeing to England, she found herself captured and placed under house arrest until her eventual beheading 20 years later. And that left baby James to be raised by nobles and tutors. In particular, he was brought up by George Buchanan. Known as the most profound intellect of the 16th century Scotland, a historian, humanist, and devout Protestant, Buchanan regularly beat his young pupil. Wow, that is very enlightened. I thought so too. Seeking to form James into a God-fearing Protestant king. And in this, he succeeded. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Here we go. James considered himself an intellectual was well-versed in literature, and was praised for his pious chastity. Chastity, chastity? Or I'm a little more interested in men, chastity? I mean, it, it doesn't really matter, Eric. Doesn't it? Because he was praised for his outward appearance of Protestant chastity, even though he was quite close over the years to a number of male favorites. Fair enough, man. You do you, boo. You do you. As long as you get an heir on that throne. That's right. That's what we need. Upon reaching his majority, and after a tiny bit of homosexual scandal in which he was literally called out by his own appointed minister from the pulpit, James decided it was high time to find himself a wife. 
my god, from the pulpit, this is- From the pulpit. This is giving me the Southern Baptist vapors, oh my god. You can see the man, you can hear the echo, and you can watch every head turn and be like, I think that's about you. Oh. The maid must be Protestant, obviously, of good character, royal blood, and of childbearing age, which was the most important. Yeah. Thus the choice fell upon 14-year-old Anne of Denmark, whose dad was the Protestant Danish king, Frederick II. The two were married by proxy, meaning neither was actually there in person, but the vows were exchanged by, you know, representatives. Very romantic. That's how I would do it. Forget the dress. Forget the catering. No cake. Oh my gosh, what a waste of time. No champagne. Open bar, though, would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone needs an open bar at something If like you're this. having a proxy marriage, you deserve an open bar. Agreed. Anne set sail to her new kingdom in August of 1589. This girl is 14. So she gets on a boat, but unexpected heavy storms forced her ship to turn back, finding refuge on the coast of Norway. My. After a few repairs, the ship, the crew, and the future queen set sail once more, only to be forced back by a leak a couple of days into the journey. Clearly the repairs did not go so well. And so, Anne of Denmark was stuck in Norway as winter set in, her journey postponed until spring. Seems like divine intervention. Does it? Just wait. Ho ho! <laughs> James, 23 years old, Desperate to marry, and even more excited at the prospect of squashing those homosexual rumors, simply could not wait. He did the most romantic thing he ever did in his entire life. He had to meet his bride. And so he decided to brave the angry winter seas and sail to Norway with a large retinue to personally fetch himself a wife. He arrived safely, united with his new bride, and stayed for some months. But while this happy couple was getting to know each other and awaiting better sailing weather, storms were brewing, literally and figuratively. Woohoo! In the winter of 1590, while James and Anne are iced in till spring, hanging out in Scandinavia, accusations flared. Danish authorities accused a coven of witches for the storms and damages that forced Anne's ship to abandon its journey. They were put on trial in Copenhagen, found guilty, and executed. That's completely logical. You see it. Because not so terribly long later, the mini ice age is going to be blamed on witches. Who can control the weather. And there was a firewood shortage, so... <laughs> Y'all gotta I be hanged. would be so PO'd about the fire witch. Oh my god, yes. That was the worst part of that entire story. Exactly. At this time in Scotland, 1589-1590, witches were certainly part of the folklore. And there was technically a law in the books, the Scottish Witchcraft Act of 1563, making witchcraft a capital offense, but it had never been put to use. But it sounds like we're about to. Oh, he's coming. Mainly witches lived in stories, much like this one. I'm sorry, is there not a gingerbread castle for them to live in? No. No one's getting eaten No here. one's I mean, eating Yes, I know candy. that's German, but... Well, Macbeth is where we get our Scottish witches, and they are, in fact, inspired from this story. Stop, really? Oh. I knew you'd be excited. Fair is foul and foul is fair. But all of that was about to change. James and Anne, bedecked, obviously, in splendor, boarded a ship bound for Scotland in the spring of 1591. James was eager to show his new bride their beautiful kingdom. But for the third time, Anne had terrible travels. <laughs> the should-be calm spring seas frothed with angry waves. Dramatic lightning struck the mast, thunder reverberated in their ears, and the winds whispered of death. They did, however, reach land safely. But the voyage had been really frightful. Like, super tough. And I would vow never to get on a boat again. No. Yeah. No, thank I, you. If I were Anne, I would also probably say I have bad luck with boats. I think I'm done with this. But that's not how things were taken. Anne was, in fact, never put to blame, despite her being the only common denominator. Huh. Once safe on dry land, rumors began 
two swirl. Nobles and peasants alike theorized foul play. Dark magic must have tried to thwart James's return to Scotland. And thank goodness, they'd say, they had such a godly king whose divine nature could overpower the treacherous spells of the devil's witches. Upon hearing these rumors, James initially dismissed the speculations. He was a scholarly man, and he did not buy into the peasant stories of fairies and demons. However, as the rumors spiraled, accusations were then thrown about, and all of a sudden, women began to confess. Out of nowhere? Well, these confessions were obtained under torture. Oh, okay. So now tell the truth of it, Caroline. Tell the truth. Based on these confessions, which were obtained under torture, the North Berwick witches acted with the devil against King James VI. Naturally. Agnes Sampson, after being tortured, revealed an astonishing plot. 200 witches, even some from Denmark, had sailed in sieves. You know that that colander like yeah. thing? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Turns out that is actually a witchy thing to be able to sail in sieves. It's like part of the lore. Oh. Well, there you have that. So, 200 witches sailed in sieves to the coastal town of North Berwick, where on Halloween night, just like this one, they met in a church. And there the devil himself preached to them and told them to devise James's destruction. So first of all, how did they get into the kirkyard? I wondered that as well. That was not explained in the literature that I could find. Mm, of course not. No. Of course not. So why James? Was it because he was this upstanding Christian monarch? Um, what was the deal? That's the interesting bit. Supposedly, the devil... Beelzebub himself viewed James VI of Scotland as his chief enemy on Earth. <laughs> okay, where did that come from? Is that from James? That's not from James. That's oh, okay. from the witches, the alleged witches. Yep. Mm -mm -mm. While we today are very confused by this, it did no end of good for James's reputation. Oh, yes. yes. So godly that the devil himself orders a hit on you? I mean... The Scottish populace just couldn't ask for a better, more devout king. Yeah. What are you, the new pope? There's no pope. We're Protestant now. I know. This is Protestant territory. But a lot of the Scots were still holding to Catholicism. Not everyone was on the John Knox train. True, but by the time James gets here, his mother, who was Catholic had been rejected, deposed. deposed, and now imprisoned. And actually, at this point, I think she's dead. So whoop, he was brought up by only Protestant tutors and nobles. He was serious. And we'll see that a little bit later on as he strikes a bit of a contrast to Elizabeth I when he ascends the English throne. You know how last time we talked about witchcraft usually flares up in times of bad weather? Mm. I looked this up, and it was unseasonably cold in the early 1590s. Unseasonable gale force winds, one instance even downing over 1,000 trees. That's a lot of trees. The theory still holds about the weather. We're going to get to some other dates in a bit, so we'll check back in with our meteorologist, Erica. Ooh. Around this time, somehow, so somehow, mm -hmm. James decides that, eh, Maybe witches are real. After all, everyone's telling him the devil's out to get him. He's feeling kind of special. Yeah. So despite his initial skepticism, James decides to question the accused himself. Okay. He personally goes up there, oversees what's happening, not just the questioning, but also the torture of these alleged witches. And when we say torture, there were a number of different things, but the most common was sleep deprivation for days at a time. Because that's not going to make you no. hallucinate or anything. Exactly. Finally, Agnes Sampson, the woman whose torture confession originally described this devilish plot against the Scottish king, and you can hear how Macbeth kind of comes in there, mm -hmm. says she can prove to him that she is a witch. Why she needed to do so, I don't know. According to the histories, she whispered in James's ear, 
Which, if I were him, I would not let her get close to me. Mm -mm. You're gonna bite off my ear like Mike Tyson. Uh, or, or curse me, if you're a... I mean, this is your moment. Yeah, this is your moment. So she whispers in James's ear the exact conversation that took place on his wedding night. Not the proxy one, but the consummation one. Between himself and the now Queen Anne. No one knows what she whispered to the king, but he himself proclaimed that he, quote, believed all the devils in hell could not have discovered the same. Oh my God. To know what passed between her lips? I would love to know because I... I don't think she had a way to know what they said. Yeah, it's so. not like she heard it from a maid later with Anne. No, because in 1590, she was hanging out in a church being preached to by the devil. Right, right. in the old kirkyard, because that makes sense. It, it, it's against the lore, but that's what we got. Here we are. But I would love to know what she yeah. said. It's one of those moments that we'll never know. And Inquiring minds need to know. That's right. We are nosy people. I can't deny that. Somehow... Whatever she said convinced this skeptical scholar. And once convinced, pious James needed to rid his kingdom of the devil's mark. The witch hunt that followed led to the accusation, arrest, and torture of around 70 people. I've seen some higher numbers. I've seen a few lower numbers because the records are incomplete. And so, again, we'll never know for sure. Worst part of it. I hate history. it. It is. Why can you not just on your deathbed sign the full like this is what happened but at least Vlad put how many people he impaled in that one letter to Matthias that was really helpful it was so actually. helpful terrible but helpful yeah thank exactly. you for counting the notorious North Berwick witches were mostly women all of whom were tortured causing many to confess shockingly and name accomplices the name Galus Duncan <gasps> oh there it is might be familiar to a few of our listeners She's featured pretty heavily in the Outlander series. Got something to say about it? Uh, Lottie Veerby, the actress, she is. Oh, she is the she's best so part good. of that show. Have you watched her in the Borgias? She's Julia Farnese. Yeah. She's so good. She's a very intense actress. I love it. And she's beautiful. Stunning. Like a picture. She looks exactly like the Renaissance painting. Botticelli, Venus. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Fangirl over. Love you, Lottie. <laughs> Her real life inspiration, the Galus Duncan, was one of the convicted quote unquote witches who was accused by her employer, who then took it upon himself to torture her until she confessed. I mean, it is the only godly thing to do. To say, oh, hey, you work for me. I'm going to beat you to a pulp. Mm -hmm. And then you can tell me you're a witch. Right. You totally. and the employer are on Makes the same Makes sense. Page. I didn't even bother naming him because he doesn't deserve to be history. Good for you, Caroline. <clears throat> yep. I gotta take a stand somewhere. Ugh. Galus Duncan and Agnes Sampson were just two of the many alleged witches put to death. In the Salem witch trials, if you confessed, you got, you got off. off. No, 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 no. That's not happening mm -hmm. here. And how were, were they burned this time? We'll get there. Okay. But, yes. <laughs> the Scots knew what to do. I'm just gonna say. Okay. They were put to death during this first great panic of 1590 and 1591. Mm, okay, so I see that you said first, and I'm not loving that because that implies a second. Oh, I'm so glad that you picked up on that. After the first wave comes a second. Right. A few years later, witches are again reported in Scotland. And again, their accusers say they are targeting King James. Ooh. Yes. It began with Margaret Aitken, the so-called Great Witch of Balweary. <gasps> what a wonderful name. She won't like it when she dies. No. But generally, it's a lovely moniker. She was accused of witchcraft in April of 1597. But skillfully, she turned her fate around. Yes, girl. She confessed, yes. But then offered to turn state's evidence, if you will, and started naming names. Okay, how many are we talking about? Lots of them. <gasps> she claimed to know of one coven alone, consisting of 2,300 witches. How do you know that many people? I don't know. It's an entire town. Scotland had a population of only one million people. That's a lot That's of a folks. Lot. That's, yeah. And here's the best part. From there, things snowballed. I, I 
Okay. Ah, Great. James VI himself approved a special commission based on Margaret's quote unquote special powers. Powers? Mm -hmm. Uh, Powers. I'm going to need you to elaborate on the powers. Yes. So despite their absolute hatred and fear of magic, Mm. her power, air quotes, was the ability to detect witches. In fact, she was so good at it that some parish courts decided her word was final. If she pronounced someone a witch, they were murdered, period space. Oh my, how Mercy Lewis of them. But the idea that one woman's yay or nay could convict a man or a woman, no questions asked, was definitely controversial. She was a woman. How can you be sure? She's hysterical. Oh, if it was a man, they would have accepted it point blank. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. But there was a sincere backlash. Reginald Scott published The Discovery of Witchcraft, Mm. denouncing the witch hunts as the, quote, lewd, unchristian practices of witchmongers upon the aged, melancholy, ignorant, and superstitious people, unquote. And he accused them of, quote, extorting confessions by inhumane terrors and tortures. I can't imagine that things turned out well for our dear Reginald. Actually, I think he was okay. Okay, I I, I see where you're going with that, but I, I don't think he was put to death for this. But it was certainly the obvious mm. common sense approach. But Margaret just kept on going. This did not stop her. How did she determine yay or nay? Oh, she had a few different ways to do this. As any good practitioner would. Uh, Yeah, because sometimes the first way doesn't work. But mainly, she would just look them in the eyes and, I don't know, see something. Or not, as the case may be. The eyes are the window to the soul. And she saw into it. She would occasionally also use the swimming test. Maybe if the accused had cataracts so she couldn't see their soul through their eyes. I, I'm not really uh-huh. sure. And this is actually the only documented time when the swimming test was used in Scotland. The only? The only time. It was not used wow. otherwise in Scotland. Other places, okay. not here. Because it's common knowledge, which is float. Duh, exactly. Obviously. But all good things, Margaret, must come to an end. While some accepted her word as God's given truth, or uh, the devil's, I guess, Others did not. To include a very skeptical prosecutor in Glasgow. To test her skills, he went to the jails and took several of her convicted witches, dressed them in different clothing, changed their hair, maybe added a nice pair of spectacles, a faux mustache. You get the idea. Mm -hmm. And then he brought them back for inspection the following day. (gasps) And this time, not recognizing them as previous victims, she declared them innocent. And that was the end of Margaret Aitken. Oh, dear. I mean, it was such an easy test. Yeah, common sense. (laughs) But if you're saying hundreds of people are witches, if you're accusing 10 plus a day, you're on a roll. You're going to be seeing a lot of these faces. The king has given you a special commission. You've got an entourage now. You go to different cities. Yeah. It's a traveling show. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Oh, yeah. She was arrested, stood trial, confessed, and was burned at the stake in August of 1597. So all told, her reign of terror lasted less than five months. Wow, okay. It's a quick rise and an even quicker fall. Out like a flame. Oh, that's good. She deserves it because she sent a lot of people to their death. Yeah. A lot of women and a couple men died on her word alone, and there was no going back once she was proved guilty. Yeah. And so... The panic of 1597 came to a screeching halt. Ministers who had sentenced men and women to death on Margaret's word were, you know, a little bit embarrassed. Mm-hmm. It's so awkward when that happens. And generally, the whole witch hunting field took a pretty big PR dive. Can't imagine why. This downfall, combined with Reginald Scott's condemnation, are said to have spurred James into action. Because while Margaret might have been a fraud, King James VI of Scotland, still no England, was confident that witches were real. And that he, you know, the devil's chief enemy on earth, he could save Scotland from the dark arts. Naturally, and he was not a phony. No, no, no. In fact, so much so, he published a book. (sighs) Yes, here we are. Demonology. Published 
long before his famed King James Bible <laughs> was a when you make that connection. Oh, yeah, it's like, oof, one and two do not match. Demonology was a how-to guide for finding and convicting witches. Written in the form of a Socratic dialogue between Philomathes, a man who hears a rumor about witches and seeks out a knowledgeable philosopher to answer his many questions. And then the fictional philosopher, Epistemon. In the book's foreword, James says that he uses a dialogue to better entertain his reader, so... Thank you, James. So thoughtful. Always thinking of us. I know we're picking on him a little bit, but I do love the Socratic method. It's a good way to do it. Obviously. In the end, he's asking and answering his own questions in this book, though, so it's not really the Socratic method. It's just a lecture. It's just a lecture. He first quotes the Bible. Exodus, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And then he goes about proving their existence, urges their destruction, and defines their punishment. He details how to identify a witch. Hint, they usually brew things and make charms from herbs. This was a big, like, <laughs> He also claims they'll have a devil's mark, a.k.a. some sort of a mole or a blemish. And often, oddly, it's found in their nether regions, leading to a very sexual aspect to both the examinations done by men. Of course. And the alleged relationship between the accused female and the devil. Oh, you dirty boy. And that is what James argues witchcraft is, a relationship. He says it is a secret conspiracy between demons and humans with the intent of causing as much harm as possible. Agents of chaos. He explains that the devil was an angel who fell from grace and now leads all the other demons or other fallen angels. This is in Chronicles in the Bible. Exactly. The devil and his minion demons approach weak, ungodly people, mostly women, because we are obviously the weaker sex. I mean Eve. Yeah, we're going to get to Eve. And make deadly packs, granting them dark powers in exchange for their wicked services. This was a pretty newly defined relationship between man, or let's be real, woman, and the devil. And it means, according to James, that people were no longer just deceived by Satan. They were in collusion. Collusion. They were in collusion with the devil, and therefore against God and God's appointed representatives on earth, like James VI. So obviously... Something must be done. You know, this is actually this is actually pretty forward thinking if you think about it. I'm excited for this. Forward thinking in a theological sense because we hadn't quite gotten to the reformed Protestantism where there is the direct relationship between God and man. You know, normally in Catholicism, you're... You have to go through the minister. Right. There's usually stand-betweens and go-betweens. So theologically speaking, he was a... Uh, he was ahead of his time as far as chatting with greater beings directly. He also thought he was ahead of his time. And he also wrote The Divine Right of Kings, so. This man had a very big opinion of his piety. A lot of time on his hands. Divided into three parts, James presents his people and his kingdom with a scholastic take on magic intended to convince skeptics and frankly, to kill witches. Goals. Exactly. Goals. Book one is about magic. James divides the various magical arts and specifically compares necromancy and witchcraft. I feel like there's a difference. Well, witchcraft is just your standard. You would know this. Of course. Witchcraft in general can be anything from healing or spells, spells, charms, all that. And necromancy deals exclusively with raising the dead to yeah. life. Book one also discusses charms, circles, and conjurations, delves into astrology, explains the devil's contract with man, or woman, and contrasts the devil's miracles, quote unquote, with those of God. The devil does miracles. Well, the devil could perform acts to make you feel- Oh, so they were like fake miracles- I got yeah, you. Yeah, because he has power. The difference between these impressive shows that the devil can put on versus what God can do. Gods are benevolent miracles, not to prove his existence. Right, whereas the devil has to use his power to make a proof or a show of something. Exactly. I can see that. Book two is about sorcery. He presents biblical proof of the devil in contrast to lore and myths. 
describes sorcery and articulates the distinction between sorcery and witchcraft. And I don't know the difference between them. And it's something I'm not going to delve into here for the obvious reason that they are both imaginary. I mean... Do you believe in witches? You're making a face. Am I going to step in a salt circle? Absolutely (laughs) not. Why tempt fate, right? Listen, I'm not inviting that ish into my life. Absolutely not. All right, fair enough. But as a descendant from a hanged witch, I've kind of got to put some stock in it. You just need to tread lightly around salt circles. It's not like John is the only one. We're descended from freaking Anne Askew, too. Ooh, you've got double. Yeah. Double, double toil and trouble. It's something, man. It's something. That's a lineage right there. I'm jealous. Uh. (laughs) He also, interestingly, outlines a sorcerer's path to apprenticeship, which... I would love to know how he found that out. To just call a hotline? 1-800 number. I think it would be a 1666 uh, number. Yes. Mm-hmm. He also details the appearance of the devil, as well as naming times and forms in which Satan most often appears. Any specifics that were interesting? The horned beast, handsome, unattractive. Tell me more. So James thinks that Satan comes in the form of respected leaders, that he can embody a dead person, that he can be your best friend. He can just become anyone and silver tongue you. Wow. To do what he wants. Which is a very frightful thing to say. It is frightful, especially coming from your sovereign, God's representative on earth, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, when we grew up, we always learned, oh, the devil is this bad, scary, terrible thing. If he's a bad, terrible, scary thing, I'm probably not going to do what he asked me to. But if he comes and he is handsome and lovely and it's appealing, I think that's more realistic. I think James is not imagining horns. Great. Book three is his conclusion. He states as irrefutable fact that demons are under the direct supervision of God and are unable to act without God's permission. Yep. He claims that God uses these demons as rods of correction when men Mm. stray from his will. Demons, James asserts, can be commissioned by witches or magicians to act against their enemies. And he quotes previous authors and bases his work on a number of treatises that came before his. So, you know, facts. Ultimately, he concludes the devilish deeds of demons will ironically end in the glorification of God. The idea was that God's not going to direct them to do anything specific. But like in Job, God allows them to do things to you, to either tempt you, correct you, these sort of things. Temptations. Right. He has allowed it to happen because if you believe that your God is omnipresent, omnipotent. He knows everything. And is all powerful, he can allow anything. And that if you are this truly godly person, then of course you will prevail against them with God's help. Therefore, he will be glorified through his strength in you. James also says that the best way to keep from falling into a demon's snare is to be godly and of course to follow the godly rulers. That's convenient. Yeah. It's a lot of circular reasoning. James also included a classification of demons. (gasps) Oh my god, tell me everything! (laughs) Spectra are the first category, and they are spirits that trouble houses or solitary places. Think Casper. Obsession are spirits that bother people at various times of the day, like a succubus. Possession are spirits that enter inwardly into a person to ruin them, exorcist style. And then there are fairies, which are illusionary spirits that prophecy, consort, and transport their servants. Fascinating. I didn't know that he actually called them fairies. He did. I know that fairies are very important to Scottish lore and mythos, but I didn't know it was in... It's in James's demonology. There you go. Also, just for fun, he touches on werewolves, vampires, and other creatures of the night. (gasps) Cue the Rocky Horror. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah, he doesn't say much. It's just they exist. You should watch out for them. They exist. So, Erica, if you have any questions, about demons, witches, sorcery, dark arcs, transportation, possession, or the supernatural, please do consult James's demonology. It's quite thorough. You know, you say that, and then I... You're going to go look it up. I have to buy this for my bookshelf. I know, you are. (laughs) All right, this work 
is believed to be the inspiration behind Macbeth's Three Weird Sisters. And when reading it, you might notice the similarities between witchcraft and Catholicism. It's weird is it? how similar they seem to be eh. for James. You write what you know. <laughs> the final pages of his book are devoted to the trial records of 1590 to 1591. The witch trials that were specially against James's godly rule and in which James looks to be the hero mm. by thwarting the devil's plans and saving the Scottish people. That is propaganda at its finest. Publish your own book and say how awesome you are and how special. Yeah. yeah. However, after writing this scholarly dissertation on the devil and publishing it in support of witch hunts because there was this PR backlash against mm -hmm. Margaret Aitken specifically and the other. I mean, it's just like a little bit of a whoopsie, right? It's, it's you know, sometimes you make mistakes. We're fallible. Yeah. After this, James's interest in witches wanes. He goes on to bigger and better things, like becoming the King of England. And so our witch happy James VI of Scotland is now proclaimed the high and mighty Prince James by the grace of God, King of England, Scotland, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, etc. Et et wow. Oh, he's very fancy now. Big potatoes. So, you know, ruling so many kingdoms takes a lot of time and energy. And just effort. And just effort. So James's witch obsession fades, but his hunting prowess does not. Soon he trades witches for Catholics. Militant Catholics are furious that the English throne is now completely Protestant. There's no more of this wishy-washy, everybody's okay, like Elizabeth I had. James is full-bore Protestant, and more importantly, virulently anti-Catholic. The most famous example of this combative conflict is the 1605 gunpowder plot in which Guy Fawkes attempts to blow up Parliament, the King, and frankly, the whole government. Sadly for Catholics, he was caught, though had he succeeded, the amount of gunpowder that he had down under Parliament was something like 25 times the amount needed, so it would have been Holy cow. catastrophic. It was like 36 barrels of gunpowder. Oh my gosh. So we're going to leave James hunting Catholics. But just because James is not with us anymore, it doesn't mean the Scottish people just poof, forget about these alleged witches wandering the moors, cursing people. No, the Scots have a very, very long memory. Really long memory. Because there are, in fact, three more Scottish witch hunt panics. Oh my god. Okay. Well, let me pull up my meteorology. <laughs> Meteorologist Erica will have a report for us in a moment. From 1628 to 31, Scotland, again, is thrown into occultist chaos with accusations and executions. This time the fervor spread from Germany, which was having its own wave of witch hunts at the time. And then again they had one in 1649 to 1650, and the last large-scale hunt and trials were in 1661 and 62. Heavy flooding? particularly the Severn in 61 and 62, but mild winter. So that one doesn't really fit. They can't all work, I guess. Which is sad. It would be nice to have an explanation, but I think sometimes people are just catty bitches. Yeah. Combined, Scotland executed more than 2,500 accused witches. So quite a few more than Salem. From a population of roughly 1 million people, that makes it five times the average execution rate across Europe. Holy cow. So Scotland was a hotbed of devilish intrigue or super susceptible to witch hunts. 85% of the accused were women, but not to worry, James had an explanation for this. Are you ready? Cannot wait. From Demonology, Philo Matthies asks, quote, what can be the cause that there are 20 women given to the craft, witchcraft, where there is but one man? And Epistemon answers, quote, The reason is easy, for as that sex is frailer than man is, so is it easier to be entrapped in these gross snares of the devil, as was over well proved to be true by the serpent's deceiving of Eve at the beginning, which makes him the more familiar with that sex since that time. Unquote. Thanks, Eve. Girl just cannot catch a break. It's always her fault. Listen, she idiot. She just wanted an apple. 
It can't all be her fault. Nope. Give some to Adam here. Nope. He's supposed to have dominion over his wife. That's right. Why isn't he fixing her witchcraft? Come on. Yeah. Scotland and James wasn't alone in falling victim to the witchcraft panics. After the Protestant Reformation, Europe was divided between Protestants and Catholics, and both sides hunted witches. During this turbulent time of religious reform, rulers, like James VI slash first, wanted to prove their godliness, that God was on their side, was with their religion. And witches, who were often outsiders or dissenters, were a wonderful scapegoat, mm. proving that those who don't worship correctly, as in the same way the ruler does, will be wiped out, and that godly monarchs will find them. But by the late 17th century, pluralism becomes much more accepted. Pluralism meaning the acceptance that different religions or beliefs can still live in harmony together. I don't know. Do you think they really believed that or do you think it was just... I think they were like, stop killing each other. Yeah, I guess it's time to be done. There were also new scientific ideas that exploded onto the scene, undermining the world's, or the church's, dogmatic certainty about witchcraft. Also, nicely, courts stopped accepting confessions extorted by torture. Novel! Hooray for small mercies. And generally, governments tried to avoid these huge panics because they realized they, they did more harm than good. The last Scottish witch execution took place in Dornoch in 1727, and in 1736, the British Parliament repealed the 1563 Scottish Witch Statute, making alleged witchcraft no longer a capital crime. There we go. And that, my friends, is that. We will leave you with one last spooky thought from James VI Demonology Ooh. before wishing you Happy Halloween and good hunting. Demons, writes James, often steal dead bodies force their way into houses, even take over the forms of upstanding community members. Quote, For if they have assumed a dead body, whereinto they lodge themselves, they can easily enough open without any door or window and enter. Unquote. So a demon could be anyone, anywhere, at any time. Demons can inhabit your mother or friend your child or partner, or even a friendly podcaster with a soothing voice. Demons are everywhere, lurking in the shadows at the behest of the devil, scouring the earth for weak souls whom they can turn into agents of chaos, better known as witches. When shall we all meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly burly's done, and the battle's lost and won. This episode is brought to you by the Pithy Chronicle, LLC. The Pithy Chronicle is intended for education, entertainment, and non-commercial purposes. Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are personal and do not represent those of people, institutions, or organizations that the owner may or may not be associated with in a professional or personal capacity. While we offer lots of sarcasm, this podcast does not offer any advice or services. Listening to this podcast may induce fits of laughter, unexpected distraction, or uncontrollable rage at the subjects. Hopefully not at us. We hope you learned something today. If not, so sorry. Please be advised we are not experts in the following fields. Medical, legal, financial, technological, thermonuclear engineering, submarine warfare, neuroscience, or cat husbandry. Thanks for listening to our little disclaimer. Just covering our history-loving asses. Bye!